Wow, isn't that awesome? Can you just give uh, God some praise for Brinson? I know he, uh, I mean, he's done so much here at the church and so much for the kingdom of God. Brinson, if you can hear me back there, we honor you. We thank you, God, for all that he's invested in the kingdom of God. Amen. We are in week three of our series on the book of Revelation. And it is my privilege to bring the word of God. If we have not met this morning, my name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, man, the Lord's really been speaking to us through this book the past two weeks. Uh, The first week, uh, Jim Reynolds spoke. And kind of what you can kind of take from that is that for one thing, this is the book of Revelation, not Revelations. Can I get an amen? Revelation, not Revelations. And that is really about the revealing of Jesus. The book of Revelation is about the revealing of Jesus. Last week, Pastor Joey brought the word of God, and uh, he talked about the signs of the times in Matthew. Uh, This week, we're in chapter 2 and 3. We're going to be talking about the church, the seven different churches in chapters 2 through 3 that were written uh, to that day and that time. And we're going to be specifically looking at the church of Thyatira. So what I want to do this morning is I want to spend just the first little bit talking about the seven churches, and then we're going to go and we're going to talk about the church of Thyatira. Are you ready this morning? Come on, are you ready this morning? Say amen. I don't want to move. I don't want to go any further without his presence. So can we just do that right now? I'm going to invite the presence of God. Let's just pray right now. Lord, just as Moses said... I do not want to go up from here without you, without your presence. Just as we sang this morning, God, I'm not enough unless you come. Lord, that is what we say today, Father. God, we say to you this morning, Jesus, that God, you can have your way. Lord, we say no spirit but the Holy Spirit in this place, God. No spirit but the Holy Spirit, Lord. We yield to you. God, we only desire truth this morning. So God, may you use the Logos word of God, your word, Jesus, and may it become a rhema today to our hearts, God. No one came to hear me today, God. They only came to hear you, Jesus. And so God, this morning we say, God, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We are here for you, Jesus. God, we say, teach us your ways, for we want to know you, God. We want to find favor in you, Jesus. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to put a map now on the screen. I want to give you kind of a visualization of these seven churches. All right, so in chapters two and three, they cover all seven churches. In the order of these seven churches are the order in which you see these laid out in clockwise order, starting with Ephesus. So in chapter two, we see Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. Then in chapter three, we see the next three, which are Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, just to the southwest of uh, Ephesus, we see uh, the Isle of Patmos is not actually on there, but you just believe me, the Isle of Patmos is there, which is where John got this revelation from Jesus, which is so fascinating is because John got this revelation from Jesus some 70 years after his resurrection. You can see red letters throughout the book of Revelation. So Jesus is speaking to John and talking to these seven churches in current day Turkey. Fascinating, right? So each of these letters written to these seven churches can be broken up into three different parts. You can see in each letter, five of the seven is very noticeable, and two of the seven is not as much noticeable, but it is there. And so there's three different parts. So praise, it starts off with a praise, then it starts off, then it goes to a correction, and then a counsel. So each of these letters have a praise from Jesus. This is what you've done well. This is how I'm counsel. Uh, this is a correction. This is what you've done wrong. And now, at the very end of each letter, it talks about uh, this is how you change what uh, has been going on in your church. Now, there's three different points of view for each of the uh, for these seven churches and what they represent. 
Theologians first off believe that each church represents a different church age. So from the resurrection and then 300, 400 years later would be the church of Ephesus. And then another 300, 400 years later would be the church of Smyrna and so on. Until we see in, our, in the day we live in, we would be the church of Laodicea. Which kind of makes sense a little bit, doesn't it? Because the church of Laodicea, they were neither hot nor cold, but they were lukewarm. How many on fire Christians do I have in this place? Don't you want to be on fire for Jesus? And you kind of see it in this day and age that there's a lot of people who are neither hot nor cold, but they're lukewarm. And for me, man, I want to be blazing hot for the Lord. I want to be on fire for Jesus. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to be hot for him. Amen. So we kind of see that point of view and I can kind of see how it uh, relates to today, but I personally don't have that viewpoint. Uh, You can have that viewpoint if you'd like. I personally don't. The other viewpoint is that these seven churches represent uh, the seven years of, of tribulation that will happen at the end time before Jesus is coming. So the, the, the first year would be Ephesus, and the last year being uh, the church of Laodicea. I don't believe that point of view either, but you could have that point of view. Some people do see it that way. Now this last point of view is one that I believe. The third point of view would be that these letters were written to these churches for that day and age for that time, and for the churches of all time. So it doesn't matter if you're in the second century, it doesn't matter if you're in the 12th century, it doesn't matter if you're in the 21st century, we can gather something from these letters. Well, the first reason I believe that is, well, it's in the Bible. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Say, amen, that's exactly right, Adam, it is in the Bible, so no duh. It's in the Bible. And just as we gather and the Lord can speak to us through the book of Ephesians, which was written to the church of Ephesus, we can also uh, lean into these letters and the Lord can speak to us through these seven letters. Now the second reason why I believe this is, is written to all the churches of all time is the plurality of how each letter ends. So at the end of each of these letters, it ends, uh, to, e- to him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, plural, plural. So let me give you some more examples of this. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, we also see the plurality of uh, how it is written. Uh, verse 4, it says, John to the seven churches, say churches, which are in Asia, Then in verse 11, Jesus shows up and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, again, this is Jesus talking, so this is red letters, Uh, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, say churches, seven churches in Asia. Then Revelation 120, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels and the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Say churches. So we see the plurality of, it's, all, it's written to all of these churches, the book of Revelation is. So what does this verse 20 really tell us? It tells us that these lampstands that we are the lampstands, we represent these lampstands. We are not the light, but we hold the light. So the higher we hold the light as the body of Christ, the higher we hold the light as the church, the more people are going to see Jesus. So Jesus said, don't hide it underneath a basket, but what? Hold it up high, put it on a lampstand so for all to see. How many of you know we are the light to this world? We are the hope of this world. And I'm telling you right now, we need to hold our light so incredibly high because, man, we have the hope of this world. And there is so much confusion, there is so much destruction, there is so much walking away from the Lord. There is, uh, just like the church of Laodicea, neither hot nor cold, but they're lukewarm. But we, as the body of Christ, can't be lukewarm. we got to hold that light high. Are you going to hold your light high? Yeah. 
You know, we uh, have a value around here that we're going to be sharing with you uh, in January. And one of the values is that we are going to be a church that evangelizes, that we take our God encounters and we give them away. We take our corporate encounters with God when we encounter the Lord together in this place. And then when you have an encounter with the Lord on a daily basis through the reading of the word of God, that you're going to take that encounter, that fire inside of you because you're not you're not uh, cold, you're not lukewarm, but you're hot for Jesus and you're going to give it away. We've got to hold our light high and we've got to tell the world about Jesus. Amen. Hold your light high for we are the hope of the world. The second thing you can take from verse 20 is this. The stars are messengers. The stars are messengers. They're angels. So the Greek word for angels is angelos, which means a messenger. Now, at the beginning of each letter, it starts off with saying, to the angel. So this word is this Greek word, angelos, which in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all refer to John the Baptist as, uh, with this Greek word, as angelos, or messenger. So what we can gather from this is when it says, to the angels, it's actually speaking to the pastors of those seven churches, so when they're saying this, it's speaking to the pastors of seven churches. So now I want to get into what I've, man, I've been praying over this message for, about this topic for literally months. The Lord laid it on my heart. And I want to get into the church of Thyatira right now. And I believe the Lord is going to shift something in our lives today. Are you ready to receive it? This is truth today, okay? Revelation chapter 2. Look at the church of Thyatira, verse 18. And to the angel, the angel being the pastor of the church of Thyatira, write, these things says the Son of God. So remember, this is Jesus talking. This is in red letters. Who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So here comes the praise. So I told you there's three different parts in each letter. Here comes the praise right here, the first part. I know your works. So just think about this for a moment. This is Jesus talking to some of you, and this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Now here comes the correction. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow, and the King James Version says, tolerate. You allow or you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Now notice it calls herself a prophetess. It is a self-proclaimed title. To teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So the Jezebel spirit is going to try to get you to do anything possible to defile yourself inwardly or outwardly. Verse 21, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Verse 24, now to, say, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have known the depths of Satan as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Here comes the counsel right here. The third part, the final part. Verse 25, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has ears, who has, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, plurality there, speaking to all the churches, but specifically written to this church of Thyatira. Now this word, allow. This word, tolerate, that we came across. He's saying, do not 
tolerate Jezebel any longer. Do not allow it to be at work in your life. Do not tolerate it in your churches. Do not allow it. So we see two different Jezebels in Scripture. The first one, which we just read about in the New Testament. So we have a New Testament Jezebel. We have an Old Testament Jeze- uh, Jezebel, which we're about to talk about in a moment. But both of these two people, they operate underneath the same power. Okay? They operate underneath the same power. The Bible tells us that there will be a power that will be so prevalent in the last days, but the Lord will release his anointing, his spirit to overcome it. Malachi 4, 5, and 6, it says this, before the great and coming of the Lord, is talking about uh, the last days, before the great and coming of the Lord, he shall send Elijah and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. What he's saying is there will be a conflict in the world that will require an end time move of God. That end time move of God will do in the world what Elijah did in the nation of Israel once again. We need the spirit of Elijah to be released upon this nation, upon our churches, upon this place. Amen? The spirit of Elijah being released, his Holy Spirit is the hope of the world, is the only thing that we need. But what did Elijah do in his nation in Israel during his time? So there was a spiritual power in that day that was represented by the person that was Jezebel, who had married the king Ahab. Ahab was the king over Israel. Jezebel was the daughter of a king who was a high priest of the, of, of the God of Baal. Her, her mother was Eliab. Eliab was a Sidonian, which stood for to entrap or to ensnare. Can't you kind of see that in, we'll see here in a moment, in the characteristics of Jezebel? To entrap or to ensnare. Now there's three things that worship to the God of Baal they kind of did. The first thing is that The the abortion of babies. They aborted babies. They killed babies. The second thing was spiritual, uh, I'm sorry, sexual perversion. And the third thing uh, was they, they sacrificed children, gender change. Can't you kind of see that in our day and time? Gender change, sexual perversion, sacrifice of children. It's rampant in our society today. So Jezebel, she married Ahab. Ahab was the king of Israel. And there was, because of Ahab's wickedness for allowing himself to be seduced by Jezebel, there was confusion all over the nation of Israel. They didn't know right from wrong. They didn't know up from down. They didn't know left to right. They didn't know what was right and what was wrong. And Elijah went into hiding to protect himself for three years. During that three years, there was a drought. Elijah was called out to confront, after three years, uh, Jezebel and the the prophets of Baal. 450 prophets, and he's just one person. 450 prophets, he's just one person. And they begin to say, let's find out who the God of Israel really is. And so they begin to pray. He began to pray. And they begin to say, uh, the prophets of Baal begin to uh, call down fire from heaven upon these altars. They cut themselves, they, uh, did, they danced around, they did everything they possibly could to bring fire from heaven from the God of Baal. All while Elijah, he's mocking them the entire time, which I love, he walked in humility, but yes, he knew the boldness of God that he would come through in the end. So they did that for a few hours. In the middle of the day, Elijah got up, it was his turn. He began to pray, fire from heaven. He actually doused the altars with three, uh, with three buckets of water. So there's water all over the altar. He begins to pray, God, send your fire. Fire came down. The water burned up, and they knew who the God of Israel was, Jehovah. The key issue to understand is this. The anointing that was on Elijah to bring transformation in the nation of Israel is the same anointing God will release in the end times. Amen? 
The same, the anointing that was on Elijah to bring the transformation of the nation of Israel is the same anointing God will release in the end times. Because the same conditions and problems, they exist today, don't they? We read these stories but sometimes can't connect it to our lives and the days that we live in. So I want to give you three things right now before we go any further about Jezebel. Three things to, to know. Number one is this. Uh, it is not a gender-related spirit. Sometimes people make a mistake that it, women can only operate in this. It's not true. It can be uh, men and women can operate in this. It can be effective. It can be a stronghold in their life. Number two, it does not like to be talked about. What happens is people start mocking this. They're like, man, those Pentecostals, those Charismatics, they don't know what, they're so weird, they're so, why are they talking about Jezebel? Why are they talking about these spirits? Listen, it's biblical. What, you don't believe in the Antichrist? We kind of pick and choose sometimes what we believe in Scripture, but man, this is scriptural. This is in the Bible. We need to take heed to this word this morning. Number three, we are not on a witch hunt. <laughs> we're not going around saying, I think that person's Jezebel. No, we're not doing that. I think this person operates in that. Nope, we're not doing that. We're observing ourselves. Listen, we're about to go through 10 characteristics of Jezebel. We can all have these characteristics from time to time. I have these characteristics in my life sometimes. We're, we need to recognize it, move from it, resist the devil, as the Bible says, and he will flee from you, right? We kind of spoke about this a couple weeks back. And I said, you know, the problem is, uh, the question is, is, it, is the problem discipleship or deliverance? And the answer to that question is yes, it's both. That's why we need so much discernment in the time that we live in to distinguish what is the issue here, what is the problem? We need to be able to discern this morning where we were at. All right, so here we go, 10 characteristics of Jezebel. Who's ready for this? Say, let's go, come on. Come on, say, let's go. So first characteristic of Jezebel is this, extreme jealousy. Extreme jealousy. What are they jealous of? They're jealous of anything and everything possible it is to be jealous of. They're jealous of your family. They're jealous of your house. They're jealous of the car. You're, they're jealous of uh, the school that your kids go to. They're jealous because someone said hey to, to you and not to them. They're jealous of absolutely everything there is to be jealous of. Everything. Ahab and Jezebel, they saw a vineyard near their castle, and they owned everything else around the countryside. But they wanted this one vi vineyard that Naboth owned in 1 Kings chapter 21. When they owned everything else, they can own everything but still want what you have. They can have everything and seem like their life is all together but still want what you have. They're jealous of absolutely everything. You know the reason why God asks you to give? It's not because he needs your money but it's out of obedience because he wants you to learn to give back. It says I'm not prideful anymore. I trust the Lord. I'm not trying to make it on my own and so I'm going to give my first fruits to Jesus. I'm going to be obedient in this. They're jealous of everything. Number two characteristic of Jezebel is this. It will not submit. It will not submit. We don't know if we're submitted until we're tested. Yeah? We don't know if we're submitted until we're tested. When there's a scripture that contradicts your lifestyle, that's when you know if you're going to be submitted or not to the word of God. They won't submit to leadership. They won't submit to accountability. They won't submit in marriage. They won't submit to authority. They won't submit. Now, this is good right here. Listen to this. Submission is when you control you, not when you're being controlled. Submission is when you control you, not when you're being controlled. It's when you give up all your desires for the sake of the gospel. It's when you give up everything for Jesus. Number three, 
Information is ammunition. Information is ammunition. They use the information they know about you against you. What you tell them becomes bullets loaded in their gun. They're going to twist anything they possibly can. Information is ammunition. Before you encounter Jezebel, your past is your testimony. But then afterwards, your testimony becomes something that is used against you. The fourth characteristic of Jezebel is this. They're very seductive. They're very seductive. It sounds like, man, I wish my spouse was like you. Man, you're so good. I wish, you, I wish they were like you, but they're not, man. But you, you mm, that's what it sounds like. Did you know that you can, you can be uh, sexually seduced, but you can also be spiritually seduced? What does it sound like? Anything and everything that you want it to sound like. It's when you surround yourself with people in your life that just tell you it's okay to sin, it's okay to do that, but they're not willing to tell you the truth of God's word in your life. There was a king in the book of Daniel, and he had prophets, and he wanted to hear the word of God for his time and for his day. But he had prophets just telling him what he wanted to hear. (laughs) He wanted to surround himself with someone who would tell him what was true. How is it helping us at all if all we hear back is what we want to hear with our walk with the Lord? Is that helping you at all? No. We have a value around here as a staff, and we say, talk it out. We want to be real with one each other for where we are at so we can get better, so we can walk in what God has called us to walk in. Yeah? We need to be able to surround ourselves with people who are going to tell us and shoot us straight. But we need to be wise about who we're listening to as well, right? They're very seductive. The fifth characteristic of Jezebel stirs up strife and sows seeds of discord. Sows up strife and sows seeds of discord. They gossip. (laughs) What does it sound like? You gather four of your friends and begin to say, I discern something, and they're being overly spiritual. I discern there's something wrong with that person over here. And they get four of their friends, begin to look at that person and kind of try to figure out what is wrong with that person. Man, that's not something we're going to do in here, are we? No. We don't kick people when they're down. What should we be doing? Man, we call out destiny in people. What does it look like? I mean, I see that person, God has an anointing on their life. I see that person over there, God is going to set them free from that addiction. I see it, I know it. I see what God is doing in their life. What does it look like? I see that person, they have an anointing to lead people into the presence of God. That person, they are a world changer. I see that person, man, they have leadership and they're walking in God authority. We're calling out the best in people, not kicking them while they're down, not gossiping about them. We're not going around messing with that stuff any longer, are we? Would you be mad at me if I told you this morning that God hates your gossip? That's what Proverbs 6 says. He hates gossip. He hates disunity. You know, that's what exactly the Pharisees did. The Pharisees, when they had a problem with Jesus, for whatever reason they had a problem with him, which he didn't have, he should have no reason to have a problem with him. They went to the, to the disciples to complain about Jesus and vice versa. They went to the disciples to, uh, they went to Jesus to complain about the disciples. What, was they, what were they trying to do? Bring disunity we've got as the church as the body of Christ be so unified why are we attacking one another online (laughs) why are we doing stuff like that 
We've got to be unified because we've got to hold the light of Jesus so high because this world needs us when they see us backbiting, gossiping about one another. It's not doing anything for them. Yeah? If you have a problem with somebody, use Matthew chapter 18. What does Matthew chapter 18 say? What you do is you go to them first. Yeah? Then you bring a witness if they don't change. If something doesn't change, they still have an pro- issue with them. After that, you bring leadership. But until you operate in Matthew chapter 18, all you're doing is sowing seeds of discord and strife, and you're bringing uh, disunity to the body of Christ. We've got to follow Matthew chapter 18. Six. The sixth characteristic of Jezebel. They begin private ministries without a covering. (laughs) They begin private ministries without a covering. We as a church were underneath the covering of Acts 29. I said earlier that we need to be able to submit. If you're starting private ministries out underneath a covering, you're doing it all wrong. I don't believe God's going to bless it. Need, you need a covering, yeah? And some people say, well, you just don't want prayer. No, we don't want your Jezebel hands laying on people. That's what we don't want. And I'm not saying we're the Holy Spirit police because we're not. But we got to discern what is right for our flock, what God has entrusted us with. It's not ours, it's God's. It's God's people, not ours. But we've got to discern what is right. Number seven, they operate in confusion. They operate in confusion. It's when you absolutely love your church (laughs) and God has changed your life, has changed your kid's life, and then you have a conversation with a person who's being influenced by Jezebel, And all of a sudden, everything feels confused. You're doubting whether or not you should still go to this church. You're doubting the job you're a part of. You're doubting even your marriage. You're doubting everything. When you walk away from a conversation confused, it's Jezebel operating. Yeah? Because God is not the author of confusion, y'all. He brings clarity in your life. He orders the steps of the righteous man. Our steps are ordered by the Lord. And so if you're confused, man, go to God. Go to God. Don't be trying to figure it out on your own. Do not get confused by this. It is the Lord who orders your steps. He is the God who brings clarity. Did you know that if you get a prophetic word from someone and we're starting to kind of begin to, to operate in this more and more, that it's not something you, you should not already know. What it does is it brings clarity in your heart about what God has already spoken to you. And if somebody gives you a word, 99% of the time, it's already something you know. You can also say, I reject that. I reject that. I don't want that. (laughs) You can do that because your words are powerful. Or you can say, man, I accept that. That identify with who I am. That is God speaking to me. You can accept or reject it. The eighth characteristic. They won't accept apologies or or forgiveness. They won't extend forgiveness. They won't accept apologies or forgive. Why? Because they have something over you and they want to control you. They'll continue, they'll continually remind you of what happened and then you continually have to go back asking to forgiveness and they like the fact that they control you in that moment. The disciples went to Jesus and they asked, how many times must we forgive, Lord? Seven times? Jesus' response was seven times 70. 
There might be someone in your life you haven't forgiven. There's a deep hurt. There's a deep pain. Part of the steps of getting heal, uh, being healed from that deep hurt, that deep pain, is to extend forgiveness to that person. Some of you this morning, the Holy Spirit, I believe even right now in this moment, is showing you someone that you need to forgive. You're seeing their face right now and you need to forgive them. You need to make a phone call at the end of service today. Call them up and extend forgiveness to them. And this is kind of a scary thing. I don't really, uh, this is a whole message probably, but the Bible says that if you do not forgive, then he will not forgive you. I don't know where that line is at, but man, I wouldn't want to walk that tightrope at all. I'd want to extend forgiveness to that person, amen? They won't forgive because they won't control over you. The ninth characteristic of Jezebel is this, they have no spiritual fruit. They have no spiritual fruit. So they make up fruit in their own life. They say that big house that they have, they say that car, they say whatever they might have, a material thing or something else is fruit. It's fruit of the Spirit. Nope. Galatians chapter 5 tells us what fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, kindness, forgiveness, self-control. I'm missing one, but you know what I'm talking about. They have no love, they have no joy, they have no peace, no kindness, no faithfulness was the other one I missed. They have none of that stuff and so they say, I've got spiritual fruit through the stuff that I have or something else. The characteristic of the Jezebel spirit is they have no fruit. The tenth characteristic of Jezebel, the final one, is this. They are never wrong. They're never wrong. They're never, ever, 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 somebody help me. Ever, ever, they're never, ever wrong. Don't turn to your spouse right now. <laughs> they're never wrong. They can be caught red-handed. It can be, uh, there can be a video of them doing what they say they didn't do and they still say they're not wrong. If that is you, check your heart. I'm not saying that you have a stronghold of Jezebel in your life, but I'm saying if you have about four or five of these things, six of these things, you're walking in, you need to pray. You know, one of the quickest things that can cause a move of God not to happen. I believe here in this place we've begun to see revival that's leading towards an outpouring of his presence that we're going to experience and we've got to continue to press in and the thing that can quench this more than anything else is this. It's this church. Gossip, disunity, confusion, Manipulation, but I believe it doesn't have any room here to operate, amen? So would you do something with me? Would you stand to your feet right now? My question to you this morning is this. Who's the Lord of your life? Who is the Lord of your life? Now maybe you walked in these doors today and say, wow, this is a really deep message for me because I've never, I haven't been in church in a very long time. This is the moment for you right now. Who's Lord of your life? Have you given your life to Jesus? But also for the person who knows the Lord, who's followed the Lord for a while now, Who's really Lord of your life? Are there areas of your life that you haven't submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Because when you make the Lord, the Lord the Lord of your life in every single area of your life, there's no room for this to operate at all. What we need is more of Jesus. 
the ministry team would come forward right now. If you do not know the Lord and you've never submitted your entire life over to him, I want to invite you forward in a few moments to receive prayer. For the person who has a relationship with Jesus, I want to ask you this question yet again. What areas of your life do you need to give up to the Lordship of Jesus? What area have you not really fully submitted to? Even the parts that you don't really want to submit to God? What area do you need to push forward and really submit to Him so He can be completely Lord of your life? Can we just do something together right now? Let's just ask for more of the Lord right where you're at. Can you just close your eyes? Come on, all over this room. Jesus, we want more of you. Lord, we desire you, Father. Come on, just begin to say, God, I need you. Come on, say, God, I need you in every area. Come on, just say, God, I need you in every area of my life. Every area. Come on, church. Come on. Come on, prayer warriors. Come on. Come on, stir the atmosphere with your worship. Stir the atmosphere right now. Come on, shift it right now. Lord, we need you in every single area. God, even the parts that we don't want to give up to your Lordship, Jesus, this morning, we make a decision right now to turn it over to you. We make a decision right now to give it all for you for the sake of the gospel, Jesus. There will not be any room for the spirit of Jezebel to operate in any one person's life any longer, God. We want freedom, God. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And God, I say in this place, Lord, release the spirit of Elijah, God. Lord, we say no spirit but the Holy Spirit spirit all over this room all over our church jesus lord we only want you so god we say freedom come on say freedom come on church say freedom lord we want you we want you god just say i want you lord all of you all of you in every area jesus we submit to you father god we love you we thank you we bless you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to right now uh, give an official dismissal, but if you are dealing with something in your life, if you need to give your life to Jesus, there's someone up here who wants to pray with you. If you have an area of your life that you need prayer for, come forward for ministry. This is a time where we can uh, really lean into what the Lord is speaking to us and get ministry so we can overcome these things. We can overcome it through one name, and it's Jesus. Amen? The name of Jesus. If you need prayer this morning, come forward. You are now officially dismissed. But for those of you, I just ask you to leave quietly. Let's stay in an attitude of worship. You guys have a great week. We love you. One last thing. If you, would, uh, if you want to, come hang out with us at uh, the town of Orange Park. Uh, we're going to be out there this, uh, today ministering to people and just sharing the love of Christ. So we love you guys. Have an amazing week. Come forward for prayer if you need.